to say that on this day, it's a day for change, it's a day to celebrate nonviolent change, that has to be said, violent change is not really change at all. All my poems are new except for this one that I wrote when I was still um, in high school. I'm sorry if I don't have the hand the hang up talking into the mic. This one is called Tinkerbell. This is one of the first poems I ever wrote. Perhaps, if we all breathe deeply enough, the bomb will not fall. Tinkerbell, Tinkerbell, fly away home. Your childhood's vanished. Little Topsy is gone. Perhaps, if we speak of life deeply enough, the world won't explode. The fairy heads of the dandelions were cut short today, sucked into the lawn boy mower altogether too fast to make a wish. Oh, Tink, I believe, I do believe, I believe you, 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 you never were. And the shorn stalks of the weeds eye me with scorn. Okay, so now we're here in Wisconsin in the present moment, and I'm going to get the hang of reading these loose sheets of paper in the wind. This one is called To My Children Out in the World. What I feared was not that the world or the social safety nets set by prior generations would somehow fail you, or that nuclear or even nuclear warfare or accident would bring human civilization to some dramatic and precipitous conclusion. What disturbed me was not the rising cost of gasoline or college or the inexorable rise of ocean shorelines or the imperturbable rise of China. I spent no more hours trying to understand why women in Baghdad and Aceh and Bulak al Dakur would choose to wear burqas on sunlit mornings, and wondering why those in Chicago and Taos and Salem would choose repeatedly to bed the same men who just beat them. And how could I feel sincerely distressed about violent threats of Islamic fanatics when I'd heard rooms of plump, pompous Lutherans invoking God to bless the slaughter of Muslims? No. I can't worry about these small things. It's a big wide world out there beyond this bedroom with your white bassinets. And I worried as I rocked you, as I fed you, as I taught you manners and language and confidence, that you somehow might not get to know how high is the sky, how wide the sea, how deep the hearts that will hold you wherever you go. Now you are gone so very far away, and I am sitting, I am knitting, not dropping a stitch in case the wide, wide world ever becomes small enough and close enough that you can see me again. Okay. I'm really glad Andy wrote before me because I was having anxiety attacks about some of my pieces being too long and then Andy went. <laughs> um, this one very specifically deals with what was happening in Egypt, what was happening here, and as you recall, during our protests here, there was that one day that was the anniversary of the Triangle Shirtways Fire. This one is called The Answers in the Wind. Where did this movement begin? Some say Tunisia. Others say it came from an unnoticed martyr, Shahid. A child, but what did she know? ventured that it came from a tall, dark angel smelling distinctly of rose water. The internet forecasters, meanwhile, looking backward, pointed their noticeably stocky forefingers at the front range of the Rockies like blizzard winds are all we are talking about here. Let's be clear. We are not just talking about a snowstorm, even though the slashing snow is presently lacerating my wool coat like hundreds of pale and pinch-faced shirtwaist workers wielding needles like bayonets on the Lower East Side long ago. Long ago. This wind goes from my world of ice and drifting snow dunes and the monstrous scraping plows barreling down the wide avenues with some tangible sense of superiority to your world. Sun and sand and stone, high rises and pyramids, and the tanks topped with implacable soldiers barricading museums full of our earliest artifacts. Yes, ours, yours and mine, yours and mine, and yes, those of the same skinny, hungry, 
angry seamstresses on Hester Street, whose relatives are right now watching Cairo from comfortable kitchens in Haifa and Tampa, clucking their tongues and clacking their knitting needles, saying, Hamubarak wasn't really all that bad, was he? He kept the peace now, didn't he? He was, he didn't he. He locked the door on the seamstresses when the Triangle Factory caught fire way back then, and he still smells like sulfur when he passes. Let us hope he passes soon. He blows, and the sands of the Sinai slowly cover the bleached bones of his tenure. He blows, and the shingles of my old house yearn and pour, pull at their ancient moorings, remembering. In Egypt, my own daughter waits for the wind to pass, for the sky to clear. Here in the snowy north, I too wait for this violent storm to subside, but not tonight. This wind howls like wolves do, only when starving, and I have nailed up all my heavy blankets to keep the desert sand from drifting in my doorway. Across the wide world, Hope, my white dove in the distant Sinai, tucks her head under a sprouting wing in her made-for-the-Arctic down bag, while beyond the flap of the fabric door, a circle of all-male Bedouins puff and chortle around their campfire, lighting the side of Mount Moses. Anybody flagging me? Cut? Okay. Then I'm going to read one more by somebody else um, that I've loved forever. This is by Denise Levertov, and I think it really talks about what we're doing here. It's a really old one she wrote, I think, in 1969. Um, it's in To Stay Alive. It's called Let Us Sing Unto the Lord a New Song. There's a pulse in Richard that day and night says, Revolution, revolution, revolution. And another, not always heard, poetry, poetry, rippling through his sleep a river pulse. Heart's fire breaks the chest almost, flame pulse, revolution. And if its beat falter, life itself shall cease. Heart's river, living water, poetry. And if that pulse grow faint, fever shall parch the soul, breath choke upon ashes. But when their rhythms mesh, then though the pain of living never lets up, the singing begins. Thanks. <laughs>